Good morning. For anyone I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Susan Bruce. I am wife to Pastor Rob, mother to our four children. I am a collective leader, and I serve on the preaching team. Hey, do you remember commercials? This generation doesn't watch commercials. My kids turn the TV on, they go immediately to a streaming service, and when they have to watch regular TV and the commercials come on, they start flicking through the other 450 channels to, until they miss the program they started to watch. But when I was a kid, commercials told a story, something that tugged at your heart. And I have this favorite set of commercials. They came out in the late 90s. I have one for you to watch. Take a look at the screen. Most popular toy for toddler, $500. Most popular stuffed animal for toddler, $350. Most popular picture book for toddler, $60. Watching her play with a cardboard box instead? Priceless. I love those commercials because they remind me that there are elements in a relationship that you can't just put a price on. That word, priceless, we use it to describe something that has such incredible value to us that we're willing to pay an extreme price. In fact, the word has a synonym, it's a king's ransom, and that really spoke to me. The idea that there are things in life that are so incredibly costly that only a king has the resources and the ability to purchase them. Today, I wanna to talk to you about those moments in your life when you don't recognize your worth, those moments where you question your value, those moments when you label yourself worthless. Please stand for the reading of the word. Our verses come out of the book of Luke, chapter 14, 25 through 30. It says, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciples, you must by comparison hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life, Otherwise, you cannot be my disciples. Pause for a minute. Jesus is not giving us permission to hate ourselves or anyone else. What he's saying is that when you love him, the love that you have for him must be so dramatically different than anything that you have ever demonstrated before that the contrast is obvious. He continues, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction for a building without first calculating the cost to see if there was enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. Let's pray. Lord, I ask you to speak to our hearts today. We want to hear what you have to say about our value. We want to hear and be reminded of your graciousness and the love that you have for us. I pray that our hearts would be soft and that the truth would fall deep into our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat, please. Carrying a cross is something that the audience would have understood. The Romans used to make the criminals carry their cross to show their authority over them and to really intensify the shame. In these verses, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he knows he's about to carry the cross. You see, the thing is that God doesn't ask us to do anything that Jesus hasn't demonstrated for us. Hebrews 4, 15, 16 says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So what are we learning today? Jesus counted the cost. He's forward-thinking. God is in our past, he's in our present, he's in our future. And so at the beginning, he knows what it's going to take to get to the end. And he knows if he's willing to pay the price. 
Hebrews 12, 2 tells us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. He knew that when he went to the cross, no matter how shameful it felt, that there was joy on the other side of that. Why is that important? Because it speaks to our value. Do you ever feel like you're not good enough? You're not enough, you're not worthy, and you're not worth it. You know God loves you, but, and that's supposed to take away all the shame and all the doubt, but you struggle. Things stick with us from when we are kids or from our past, lies that were spoken over us, words, labels, bad choices, things we've done. When I was 16, I went to a family anniversary party. Now, I am the second youngest of 12 cousins, so you can imagine that by the time I was 16, there weren't a whole lot of single people in the room. And so, um, when I got bored, I decided I was gonna be bold, because I'm rather on the bold side, and I got up and I asked the only single guy in the room to dance. And we were dancing and everything was fine, and then all of a sudden, my youngest cousin flew into the restroom. Hot on her heels was an older cousin that I looked up to, and as she walked past me, she turned around and said, nice job, big mouth. Now, I did not have any idea what I had done, but I knew I had done something. And so when the dance was over, I followed them into the restroom only to find out that my youngest cousin had a crush on the guy that I had asked to dance but didn't have the courage to ask him herself. But my older cousin, those words that she spoke to me, what it said was, you're outspoken, you're insensitive, you're unaware. It ruined the rest of my evening, truthfully, and it stuck with me. It is still stuck with me. And so I know that God made me bold and he's given me times when I'm supposed to speak. But every time I get this, I, this, I know it, but yet I question. Lord, is that from you? And then when I do have the courage to speak out, I literally hold my breath to see, how's it going to land? Is it going to be okay? Is it going to be received? Or am I going to have opened my big mouth again? Lies take root in our identity before we have our encounter with God, before we know who we are, before we know whose we are. And we become filled with doubt, shame, and insecurity we feel worthless. Can you relate? But God knew you and decided your value before you were even born. He counted the cost and labeled you priceless. He knew that you'd lie to your parents. He knew that you'd steal from your employer. He knew that you'd cheat on your spouse. He knew you'd be overcome by fear, consumed by anger, crippled by addiction. He knew you'd be rebellious and self-serving. He knew you. Before you were born, he decided your value, he counted the cost, and labeled you priceless. That's truth, and it's powerful. And it's meant to transform, but only if you take hold of it. For it to do its job, you have to receive the truth. That's our point number one, receive the truth. Receiving can be hard, though. I can remember a couple years ago, Rob and I took the kids down the casinos and we were enjoying the evening, strolling through the, um, the hotel that we were at. And we went and had burgers and fries at the food court. Now you can imagine that burgers and fries for six people at the casino has a nice price tag to it. And so when we left, we passed a market in the casino. And we went in and we were looking around and in the middle was a beautiful dis- uh, display case filled with dessert. Now, we all have a sweet tooth, and my kids were looking at dessert and saying, oh, I want that, and I want that. And I put my mom hat on, and I decided I was going to teach a lesson about money. And I'm sitting there, and I'm telling them, look how much that's going to cost. Times that by six, how much? We just spent this much on dinner. If we spend this much now, how much is this night going to cost us? Could we go home and go to the grocery store and buy a half a gallon of ice cream? Wouldn't that last for more than just one night? And then we'd have money left over to do something else. When this lady walks over to me and says, excuse me, I'd like to buy your children a treat. And I heard this little whisper in my head that said, oh, 
God wants to bless my kids. And then there was this glaring shout that came in behind it. Uh-oh, you opened your big mouth again. She heard you talking. She heard you talking about money. She thinks you can't afford to treat your kids. She looks, she's looking at you. How, and then I looked, how are they dressed? Do we look okay? Do we look like we don't belong? Does she think you can't take care of your kids? And I politely declined. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, but we're good. And then she insisted. She said, please, I have a comp. I'm here. This is my last night. I can't use what they've given me. It's going to go to waste. Please let me treat your children. So I decided I was going to listen to the little whisper, and I was going to let the lady buy the kids a treat, and they started one at a time. I want that, and I want that. So Rob ushered them out of the store as I stayed with the lady. And as she began to pick up the box of cookies that she was going to buy, my anxiety level went from down here to all the way up here. And then she did something that made it go higher. She grabbed something else. And then she grabbed something else. And before she was done, my anxiety was only up, up here and I could barely breathe. And so I think, okay, it's just a minute. We're going to go pay and it'll be over. And then I remembered, it's a weekend. And so we went to the line, and the line was from the counter all the way to the end of the room. And I had to wait with this lady for like 10 or 15 minutes. All the whole time, my head is spinning. And so finally we get to the end. She paid, I thanked her, and I'm leaving. And my anxiety starts, start, starts coming down. And I start praying, and I'm like, Lord, all right. That was way out of proportion. It was painful. I know you wanted to treat the kids to something, so why was it so painful for me? And I don't know about you, but I know when it's a God moment because God starts talking right back to me as soon as I start speaking. And he says, Susan, you have a problem receiving. And I said, I do? He said, yes, even from me. I said, really? I thought I was generous. He said, yeah, when you have to give. When you give, you're in, you decide who, what, when, how much, you're in control. But when you receive, you have to trust the other person. You have to depend on them to meet your need. You have to depend on them to show up. You have to depend on me. And I was like, uh-oh. But Jesus said, if you abide in my word and you are my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That word abide, it means to remain, to dwell, to make it your own. You have to receive. The word for know, it means to understand. It means to be sure. It means to be resolved. And so what he's saying is you've got to take the truth of his word, his teachings. You've got to take them in. You've got to take them in up here. You've got to take them in in here. They've got to get all the way down here till they're in the center of you until they, they bring you to a place of resolve, unshakable determination. So what's our truth today? That Jesus counted the cost. In John 12, 27, he said, my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. So what are the reasons that he came? He came to show us the Father. He came to show us a life of dependency on the Holy Spirit. He came to pay the ransom for his church, the king's ransom, to bring the Father glory. And when we receive the truth, we're giving a gift to the Father. We're taking what Jesus came for, and we're using it to change ourselves, to be transformed. And that's a gift to God. It brings him glory. And when we don't do it, there's no gift. There's no glory. So let me give this some legs, right? Every day, I wake up and I start my diet. Every day is day one. It's like Groundhog Day in my house. And so it goes like this. No carbs today. 
I'm gonna do it. I've got the Holy Spirit. A fruit of the Spirit is self-discipline. Here I go, day one. Now, I can tell you 100% when it comes to about one, two o'clock in the day without even looking at a clock, because that's when my carb cravings start. And so, like all of you, I live a very busy life, and every day, whatever my overload of schedule or emotion is, I come to that time where I have to decide when I go into the kitchen, whether it's home or work, am I going to have a salad, or am I gonna grab the pizza that's sitting on the table? Well, let me just tell you that pizza is my favorite food, so where do you think I go? And then I tell myself this, it's okay. It's just one carb, just one. It's low carb, not no carb, it's all good. And then one becomes two, and two becomes three, and before you know it, it's like, eh, I'm back to day zero again. And so, this is my spiral. At the end of the day, when I look back, oh man, I missed it again. I screwed it up. I can't do it. What happened? The fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be self-discipline. I have no self-discipline. I can't even control myself for one day. I sinned. I'm not worthy. I'm not worth it. I hate myself. We all have our things that spiral us into self-loathing. We jump from I made to wrong choice to I'm not worthy of love. But sin is not who we are, it's what we do. When your children don't tell you, they don't do what they tell you, you tell them to, they're still your children. Their identity hasn't changed because they didn't obey. You don't love them any less. Romans 5.8 tells us, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While you were still cheating, while you were stealing, while you were looking at your parents and lying while you were in addiction, while you were in a rebellion. Christ died for you. He counted the cost and labeled you priceless. And even though you recognize that this is the kind of truth that has the power to transform, it still seems easier to hold on to the lies. But we have to receive the truth and reject the lies. That's also a struggle. And point number two, reject the lies. We struggle with that one because there's truth in our self-doubt. When there's truth mixed in with a lie, the lie becomes more believable. So if I stood here and I told you, I have blonde hair and I'm 25, you'd lean over to the person next to you and you'd say, that lady's either lying or crazy. But if I stand here and I tell you that I have warm brown hair and I'm 50, that's believable on the surface, isn't it? because my warm brown hair, I do have brown hair. It's not warm though, the warm comes out of a bottle. And I'm not gonna tell you how old I am today, but I am 50-ish. <laughs> so let's go back all the way to the beginning. Creation, Genesis is the first book in the Bible, chapters one through three. In six days, God makes everything. And at the end of the sixth day, he makes a man, his prized possession, Adam. And he takes Adam and he puts him in the garden, and he gives him some things to do, some instructions, and then he gives him one warning. He says, you can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of the, no of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from that one, you are sure to die. A few verses later, God decides that Adam shouldn't be alone and he makes Eve. So one day, Eve is standing over by the forbidden tree and she encounters the snake, the serpent. And the serpent decides to test Eve's knowledge of the truth. Does she really know it? Is she resolved? Does she have it? And he tells her, did God really say that you can't eat from any of the, tr of the fruit from the trees of the garden? And she says, no, God didn't say that. God said that we're not allowed to eat from the tree in the middle. We're not even allowed to touch the fruit. And he knows she doesn't have it quite right. It's not resolve in her. So he challenges what God says and tells her, you won't die. Well, 
That word, for surely die, it could mean drop over dead. It could also mean to become worthy of death. God had warned Adam, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be worthy of death. And they did it. But they didn't drop over dead. They ate and they became worthy of death. Worthy contains an element of deserving. Worthy demonstrates that we can work for it. But we're not worthy. Ephesians 2.9 tells us salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. We're not worthy. But when we take that truth and we use it to measure our value, we get stuck in a lie because worthy and worth it are not the same. The purchaser decides how much they're going to pay. The purchaser decides worth. And Jesus came to be a ransom for many, to purchase us back from the hands of the enemy. He knew when he spoke the first words of creation, he knew what it would cost. He knew what it would cost to overcome anything we've ever done. He knew. And he was willing and able to pay the price. And so we need to come into agreement with God. Because when, we, when we're not in agreement with God, when we step out of that, we're in rebellion. But when we come into agreement with God, we bring fo- glory to the Father. So it's time. It's time to reassess our worth. And that's our point number three. We have to believe what God says about us. We have to believe that he decided that we are worth it. Think about this. When you go to sell your house, when you put it up on the market, you hope that the person that in your neighborhood that put it up before you sells for a higher value because it's going to automatically increase the value of your home. If somebody walks in and you have your, your house listed for $300,000 and they want to give you four hundred dollars because they love it, are you going to tell them, oh no, don't do it. It's not worth it. No. You're going to receive with joy what they have offered you. So why is it different with God? We confuse who we are with what we do, but our choices, they don't change our value. But knowing our value can change our choices. I'm going to say that one again. Our choices don't change our value, but knowing our value can change our choices. I'm going to read some verses to you from Ephesians 1, 4 through 7. It's written by uh, the Apostle Paul. I'm going to read them to you as if God himself was speaking. Please, close your eyes, clear your minds, and hear what God has to say to you today. Are you ready? Even before I made the world, I loved you and chose you in Christ to be holy and without fault in my eyes. I decided in advance to adopt you into my own family by bringing you to myself through Jesus Christ. This is what I wanted to do, and it gave me great pleasure. So praise me for the glorious grace that I have poured out on you who belong to my dear son. I am so rich in kindness and grace that I purchased your freedom with the blood of my son and forgave your sins. Open your eyes. God knew you and decided your value before you were even born. He counted the cost and labeled you priceless. To have the value worth the king's ransom. Grabbing hold of the truth, pushing aside the lies, claiming your true value is all going to take practice. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take resolve. Who are you going to believe? The other broken people in the broken world, or our perfect king, the one who decided our value before he began construction. Receive the truth today. Reject the lies. Reassess your worth. You're not worthless. You're priceless.